Previously on a very odd caster. So I see Kansas City beating the 49ers. Um, I'm going to say it's going to be close. Let's say it's a three-point game. I get the Chiefs by three. A new year means new television shows, right? And there is that show, another reality show that everyone's tuning into. And that is, of course, Farmer Wants a Sheep. Oh, there's one now. Yes, that's right. And we kind of know who the two candidates are going to be. That's right. We have a rematch, folks. It's Deja Fools all over again. <laughs> oh! <sighs> well, guess what? Caster's Pub's doing dry January, too. No booze here at Caster's Pub. Very odd news. A customer has filed a negligence lawsuit against Duncan, claiming he was injured by an exploding toilet. How does a toilet explode? The employees say there was a problem with the toilet. Sounds like these explosions have happened before. I mean, they ought to move that thing into the uh, circus, right? Step right up, step right up and see the exploding toilet. A man crashed his car outside a Bass Pro Shop in Alabama, stripped down to his birthday suit, and plunged into the giant aquarium inside the store. <sighs> the ordeal happened Thursday night in front of shocked shoppers in the town just outside Birmingham, Leeds Police Chief Paul Irwin said. Are we sure it wasn't Steve Irwin? By God, and we're here at the aquarium in Leeds, Alabama. And these gorgeous, gorgeous stuffed animals all over the wall on display. And crikey, there's creaky and crocky cookie. <laughs> look, look at this beautiful species floating around in the <clears throat> aquarium. A Kentucky city has come up with an out-of-this-world campaign to promote tourism. The Lexington Convention and Visitors Bureau used an infrared laser to beam a message into space to invite extraterrestrial travelers. They could have just put up a billboard in L.A., Hello, and welcome to another episode of A Very Odd Caster, the February edition of A Very Odd Caster. Now, as you can see here at Caster's Pub, uh, we are once again well stocked with booze. And uh, if you tuned in last month, January's edition, uh, you might recall that we had no booze for sale here because... Last month was dry January. And so Caster's Pub decided to get into the act and be like all the cool kids and celebrate dry January by not selling any booze. Now, business kind of sagged. I'm not going to lie. Our January numbers were way down for some reason. But they're back up again here in February because... We now have booze once again. It's never too late to adjust the camera. <clears throat> anyway, so yes, this is the February edition, and we're going to catch up on a few things because a lot has happened since we last met. Um, so, of course, a couple weeks ago was the Super Bowl. Now, that was a great Super Bowl. Uh, 
whether uh, you cared who won or not, it was a really good Super Bowl. It went right down to the wire. That Mahomes character has proved that there's a little bit of distance between him and the rest of the pack now that Brady's gone. Uh, Mahomes, you know, who do you not want to have the football with time running out in the game and uh, the game on the line if you're the other team? You don't want Mahomes to have it. And that's the ultimate test of respect. There's a lot of great quarterbacks, and they don't quite have that kind of clutch factor that Mahomes has. So the Chiefs won second in a row. So I see Kansas City beating the 49ers. Um, I'm going to say it's going to be close. Let's say it's a three-point game. Of course, we were graced with the presence of the lovely Taylor Swift in the uh, Chiefs box there. And of course, we'll all miss all the publicity on that relationship. So February, of course, is a unique month in the year of 2024 because it is a leap year. There's an extra day in February. And uh, interestingly enough, the 29th is also a Suicide Prevention Day. No! Mimi. So the Super Bowl was a really excellent game. And you know, if you're my age, and God help you if you are, but you probably remember the 70s. Every Super Bowl was a blowout. Every game was 28 points, 35 points. It was over by halftime. In fact, I used to call it the Super Bore because it was a joke. And, you know, it became as they built up the halftime performances into this big thing and all the uh, bells and whistles, Super Bowl Sunday became more of a party than an actual football game. But, you know, it's turned the tide. And that was probably in the, I don't know, early 90s maybe? I don't know. But it's... Most of the games are really good. Certainly lived up to its hype this year. And uh, the Chiefs did it, and they're going to go for a three-peat next year. We'll see. We'll get back to that in a minute. But first, I wanted to uh, catch up on some very odd news. That's right. These are real news stories uh, that just makes one shake their heads. And... Uh, well, we're going to start with uh, the beginning of the month of February, Groundhog's Day. This one comes to us from Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. And the headline says, Punxsutawney Phil predicts an early spring at Groundhog Day festivities. Punxsutawney Phil predicted an early spring on an overcast Friday morning at Gobbler's Knob in Pennsylvania. Do we really need to know about Gobbler's Knob. Thank you. I'll be here every month. So they had this uh, ceremony in Gobbler's Knob. Hey, Gobbler, how's your knob doing? It's a little sore. <laughs> Damn, Punxsutawney Phil was hungry. <clears throat> so this is the scene of the largest and best known Groundhog's Day celebration in the United States. And of course, when, uh, I, I, can, I can never keep it straight. I think when the Groundhog from Punxsutawney Phil comes out of the hole, if he sees his shadow, he retreats to his hole and that means six more weeks of winter. And if he doesn't see his shadow, I think, then that means spring's coming early. So apparently, uh, Phil, oh, it was an overcast Friday. So I think my critical thinking skills are at work here. But I'm thinking because it was an overcast Friday, Punxsutawney Phil did not see his shadow because there's no sunshine. And therefore, 
it's going to be an early spring, and I know we're all relieved. You know, you saw that movie with Bill Murray where things kept recycling everything. And, and interestingly enough, President Biden didn't see his shadow either on Groundhog's Day, and that means four more years of forgetting the names of world leaders. Ah! Oh, come on, it's true. Punxsutawney Joe. Meanwhile, four more years of indictments for the other guy. So, oh! Yeah. We don't play favorites here on A Very Odd Caster. We call them like we see them. I can't see shit without my glasses. Oh, there, okay, we're on. Okay, <clears throat> this next story comes to us from Rhode Island. Johnston, Rhode Island. Not to be confused with Johnson, Rhode Island. <laughs> Bunch of dicks in that town. Now this is Johnston <clears throat> with a T. And this came to us from February 13th. The headline says, Hiker kills coyote with his bare hands after attack. Tests confirm the animal had rabies. Whew. This is a badass, man. Kills a coyote with his bare hands. A rabid coyote. Oh, jeez. A coyote that a hiker killed with his bare hands has tested positive for rabies. The Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management and the Rhode Island Department of Health announced. They needed two government agencies to announce the same thing. How many government agencies does it take to change a light bulb for that matter? The hiker was attacked on Friday and bitten on the leg while walking in the woods in Johnston, according to police. The hiker pinned the coyote down by its neck, killing it by cutting off its air supply, police said. Normally, I'd really be feeling sorry for the coyote. Actually, I am feeling sorry for it because the thing can't help it that it had rabies. But coyotes are a little dicey, right? Anyhow, the same coyote is believed to have attacked a dog walker the day before in nearby Skituate. Skituate? These towns, man. How do you pronounce this shit? Skituate. Skituate. Who cares? Some freaking town. <clears throat> But anyhow, this coyote had been causing some problems around, so this dude just killed it. But then it was too late because he had already been bitten, and then he tested positive for rabies. When asked about the incident, the hiker said, Me, me. It's twice I've done a Roadrunner joke in this edition of a Very Odd Caster. It just doesn't get old. Okay, the next story. I'm going to read the whole thing because this is going to be fun. <clears throat> Apparently, down in Florida, you've heard the expression, Florida man. Uh, it's, it's sort of a running gag because the headline is always, Florida man does something really strange and gets arrested. Um, a lot of strange folks in Florida. So anyhow, the, the headline here says, at the Florida Man Games, big crowds cheer competitors, evading police and wrestling over beer and other things. So apparently <laughs> they've, they've organized sort of an Olympics competition uh, called the Florida Man Games. So that's the premise here. And this is going to be fun. I'm, I may have to put on my specs for this one. But anyhow, <clears throat> we'll give it a shot. This takes place in the historic town of St. Augustine, Florida. They rose up by the dozens from across Florida, caricatured competitors in tank tops and cut-off shorts for a showdown that treats evading police and wrestling over beer like Olympic sports. 
Promoted as the most insane athletic showdown on earth, the Florida Man Games poke fun at the state's reputation for bizarre stories that involve brawling, drinking, gunfire, reptile wrangling, and other antics carrying a risk of time in jail or intensive care. The games kicked off Saturday with the Star Spangled Banner played on electric guitar. It was Little Jimi Hendrix IV. Then spectators, sipping canned beers behind metal barricades, cheered and frequently shouted expletives as a dozen teams battled in contests inspired by real events from America's most surreal state. Holy cow. James Gordon of DeLand, DeLand, they need to have pronunciation in parentheses, you know. DeLand? DeLand, hey man, I'm from DeLand, man. That's what they call Cleveland, the land. I don't like that nickname. I don't know. I don't know why, I just don't. So anyhow, James Gordon of DeLand won the first event. Wolfing down a plate loaded with barbecue pork and sausage a fraction of a second before his nearest competitor, he chugged a beer to celebrate. I've lived in Florida my whole life, Gordon said after washing sauce from his hands and beard. They're calling these events. I'm calling this shit Tuesday afternoon. Doesn't actually say shit, but it says in parentheses, expletive. So I'm going to guess that James said a bad word, which would have been shit. <clears throat> the internet's great, man. You can just say whatever the you want. One event had contenders dueling in muddy water in an inflatable pool, pummeling each other with weapons made from pool noodles and duct tape. Another was a theft simulation relay. <laughs> in which competitors raced while toting a pair of bicycles, copper pipes, and catalytic converters. Surprised they didn't have a Kia. Larry Donnelly trained for the relay race by riding a bicycle around his neighborhood with a second bike strapped to his back. It paid off Saturday when he won his heat after picking up a bike in each hand and running with them. That boy, Larry. I have an absolute disregard for self-preservation. I will do anything, said Donnelly. 42, who owns a St. Augustine pressure washing business and serves as captain of the five-man team Hanky Spanky. When I was in the military, I did a little alligator wrestling. Of course. Okay. So other events involved contenders wrestling sumo style while holding pitchers of beer or running from actual sheriff's deputies while jumping fences and avoiding obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. God. This is great. This is fucking great. Others. <laughs> <clears throat> Others faced a scramble to grab cash flying in simulated hurricane winds. Spectators paid real money, $45 per ticket or more, to watch the games at Francis Field in downtown St. Augustine. Yusuf El Shahibi said he and his wife made the 180 mile, 290 kilometer, in case you're using the metric system to figure out where the fuck you're going, <clears throat> made the 180 mile trip from porn porn did I say porn I don't know if they had that in the Florida man games they would not want to watch it though so anyhow this Yusuf El Shahibi 
said he and his wife made the 180 mile trip from Port St. Ritchie to watch stupidity occur on the grandest, most spectacular scale. Knock yourself out, Yusuf. Organizer Pete Melfi. There's got to be a joke in there somewhere. Pete Melfi said he expected ticket sales to exceed 5,000. He said he was stunned to find nobody else had beaten him to the ripped from headlines idea for a spoof sporting event. He, he must have gotten off the onion or something. We kind of give a person an opportunity to live a day in the life of Florida man without ending up in a cop car, said Mel Fi, who runs the St. Augustine media outlet, the 904 Now. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that 904 might be their area code down there. Just a hunch. Again, critical thinking skills at work. But he had to tone down some racier aspects of the Florida man mythos to obtain a permit. There's typically drugs and nudity, he said, but the city frowned on it when I asked for drugs and nudity. <laughs> what were they going to do? Instead of a hot dog eating contest, it was going to be lines. Who can do the most lines, dude? <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> And besides Florida man and nudity, woo, conjures up all sorts of negative images. The Florida man phenomenon seeped into the... Oh Why do they use these fucking adjectives? The Florida man phenomenon seeped into the nation's conscience, thanks in part to a Twitter account that started in 2013 with the handle at underscore Florida man. The account touted real life stories of the world's worst superhero, sharing news headlines such as Florida man bites dog to establish dominance and Florida man tried to pay for McDonald's with weed. <laughs> ah, so that's how it started. I thought it was the onion, but I don't know. Maybe I'm giving the onion too much credit. They slipped a little bit. <clears throat> Florida's claim to being the strangest state goes back much further, said journalist Craig Pittman, who wrote the book, Oh, Florida! Exclamation point. How America's weirdest state influences the rest of the country. He noted that the first flag to fly over its capital in 1845 bore the motto, Let us alone. Hmm. Not a bad motto. Apparently nobody listened. Florida today is 22 million residents, the third largest population of any U.S. state. Wow. Wow, man. So it's passed somebody. New York, California, Texas. Texas is growing. It hasn't passed Texas. I bet you it's passed New York because half of Florida is from New York. So 22 million residents, and they all share roads, beaches, and timeshares with more than 130 million tourists per year. And that will include myself later this week. Yes, I'm going to get some sun. Because I need it. You cram that many people together, they're bound to start running into each other's cars and chasing each other with machetes, Pittman said. Pittman noted there have also been plenty of crazy stories featuring Florida women. I betcha. And plenty of them turned out to watch the game Saturday. Sally Yarbrough and her daughter Danielle Yarbrough got tickets as a Christmas gift from their boss, along with a case of vodka. Hopefully, more women will be here like us, Danielle Yarborough said. We're usually the only rowdy ones. The only women's event Saturday was a Florida Mam pinup contest. <laughs> oh, God. That should change if the games continue, said Lori Ice Fetrick, the former competitor of the 1990s show American Gladiators, who served as a judge at the Florida Man Games. I personally believe we need the Florida Woman Games. 
Fetrick told the crowd, which cheered its approval. Or maybe put women against the men. Yeah, maybe so. Leading up to Saturday, Joshua Barr and his Cooter Commandos teammates spent time whipping up fan support on Facebook with posts showing the trio chugging Pabst Blue Ribbon beer and jogging in jean shorts and mirrored sunglasses. <sighs> their team name comes from a turtle species celebrated by their hometown of Inverness. They could get the weird out of Florida by getting the weird town names out of Florida. The commandos didn't stop with online promotion and trash talking of rival teams. Barr, a 37-year-old movie reviewer and podcaster, said they also printed t-shirts, temporary tattoos, and a large custom flag to wave on the field. We might be taking it more seriously than most people, Barr said. You kind of just have to be a part of the joke at this point. So, that's some funny stuff. So, I'm going to have to uh, order my Florida Man competition tickets for 2025 pretty soon, because I think this is going to catch on. All right, uh, let me do one more very odd news story. This comes to us from Valentine's Day, February 14th. This, you know, this happened on Valentine's Day. It's not a Valentine's Day story, per se. But as you will soon discover, it could be. So this happened on Valentine's Day. <clears throat> Caught at border with pythons in his pants, New York City man fined and sentenced to probation. Whew. Federal prosecutors say a New York City man who admitted to smuggling three Burmese pythons in his pants through a U.S.-Canadian border crossing was sentenced Wednesday to a year of probation and fined $5,000, prosecutors said. Calvin Batista, age 38, crossed into northern New York with the hidden snakes on a bus from Montreal to New York City on July 15, 2018. The young adult snakes were hidden in the inner thigh of his pants in snake bags tied to the pants drawstring. Imagine the Border Patrol's surprise. Is that a python in your pants or are you just happy to see me? <sighs> so, yeah, he was sentenced on Valentine's Day. It didn't actually happen on Valentine's Day, but I thought, you know, that would be a pretty, pretty sweet Valentine's Day story. Some dude shows up with flowers to his date. And they're going out on, maybe it's their first date, you know, and love is in the air and who knows what might happen, right? <clears throat> and uh, she said, oh, that's so sweet. Um, is that a python in your pants? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, anyhow. So Valentine's Day was here and, you know, that's just one of those days that, it gets blown up and there's a lot of expectation, anticipation. I don't know. It just doesn't seem to ever live up to its hype. But anyhow, I thought in, in a nod to Valentine's Day, we could recap some of the um, famous couples in history, both in history and uh, contemporary couples. Um, and so, you know, if you go back in history, of course, you go into the Adam and Eve. I mean, that was the first couple, right? You know, it all started there, right? Forbidden fruit and all that stuff. Fig leaves, you know. And, um, so that was probably the first famous couple. But in more modern times, let's see, you know, you go back to like Bonnie and Clyde. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. They kind of glamorized it like Hollywood does. But Bonnie and Clyde, was, they were an actual couple. Not only did they rob banks and shoot people, they uh, a romantic couple as well. Um, so that's one. Uh, back in those days also, there was uh, Bogey and Bacall, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, two 
famous movie stars from the the golden era of of Hollywood. You know, Humphrey Bogart had that style of speaking, and don't ask me to imitate Lauren Bacall, sweetheart. But they, yeah, they uh, they were a classic Hollywood couple. I don't know, Romeo and Juliet, of course. You know, the most famous play of of all time. Um, Shakespeare, he, uh, you know, Romeo and Juliet, two tragic, you know, star-crossed lovers, you know, <sighs> just, you know, um, let's, John and Yoko, that was a love story, man, I mean, it was weird from day one, you know, but they were definitely a love story, you know, John and Yoko, dang, so, and I'm a big Beatles fan, so I'm, I'm down with John and Yoko. Now, this one, not everyone might remember. You'd have to be uh, someone who watched the old soap operas. I don't even know if soap operas are on anymore in, in, the, in this day and age of streaming and everything. And I don't think they are. I think most of the soaps are, are gone. But there used to be a soap opera called General Hospital. And... One of the classic couples, probably one of the classic couples of all time on any soap opera, was Luke and Laura. I'm trying to remember the dynamics. Laura was a young gal, probably late teens, uh, sort of the girl next door. And she was, uh, I think she was engaged to some med student, um, squeaky clean all-American dude, I forget his name, and then Luke was uh, a pimp, because of course, but he was a lovable pimp, you know, because of course, and Luke and Laura wound up getting together, and Laura left her med student, uh, all-American boy for a pimp, because of course. Oh, and I forgot to add this little tidbit. They got together because Luke raped Laura. Yeah, because you know, it happens all the time. Pimp rapes all American girl. All American girl falls in love with pimp, dumps future wealthy dude. <sighs> I don't know. But you know, they you know, Luke supposedly had this, you know good side to him and he was just trying to get his act together and he was tangled up with all the wrong things and he was you know pimping out women i know it's just but they were like the thing and right around that time was also another classic couple charles and diana uh, that was you know one of the most watched television events in history when they got married the royal wedding and of course that didn't end too good um what else do we got here? Um, then, of course, you know, rolling through more modern times. Um, oh, well, there's OJ and Nicole. That one didn't go so well. Um, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith. They're an interesting couple. Uh, when Will isn't slapping people, that is. Blake Shelton and Gwen Stefani from uh, The Voice, you know, they, uh, you know, <clears throat> critiquing singers just created the sparks, I guess. Who else? Kanye and Kim, they're not together anymore, but they were an interesting couple. I mean, any anybody with Kanye is interesting and anyone with Kim is at risk for having a video taken of them. Leo and Kate, Leo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet from the classic movie, uh, Titanic. Oh, and this is my impression of the love scene from Titanic.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's see, what else here? Oh, Jen and Ben. <clears throat> uh, Jennifer Lopez, that hot tamale, and uh, Ben Affleck, that tall, dark, handsome dude with the high, squeaky voice. <clears throat> you, can you can borrow my voice, Ben. It'll help you. <laughs> I'm such an arrogant prick. Uh, yeah, those two, they were together like 30 years ago. And I remember reading all of Ben's friends were begging him to run, to get away from Jennifer Lopez. She was a man-eater. You know, it'd be worth, worth it, you know. Uh, not really into cannibalism, but I'd, I'd be down with that. So they broke up and, you know, she married, she's been married a few times. He was married to uh, Jennifer Gardner. Gardner. Um, another Jen. Ben has a thing for girls whose name rhymes with his name. I'm going to go out on a limb. Anyhow, somehow, Ben and Jen Lopez found each other again. And they're, I think they're married. I don't know. Beyonce and Jay-Z. Now there is a power couple. I mean, power. They ooze power when they walk into a room. <sighs> of course, we mentioned Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. I think they're still together. Hadn't heard much in the last couple of weeks. You know, now the Super Bowl's over. Maybe they got their publicity. I don't know. Now they're probably still together. Uh, but, uh, eh, more power to them, you know. I'm okay with the Chiefs. Kelsey's from my hometown. He's a Hall of Famer. And uh, I like how Taylor Swift uh, told the record company to pound salt. Um, so she's, I kind of like her spirit there. So they're the, they're the thing. Who knows, by the time I edit this, they may be a thing of the past. So, um, And last but not least, there is... <clears throat> Harry and Megan. Now, you may recall on one of the first episodes of A Very Odd Caster, uh, we were promoting Harry and Megan urinal cakes. That was when they were on one of their tours and they were going on TV and they were you know, pouring out their their sorrows of how rough their lives had been. Yeah, but Megan's beautiful. So, you know, I, I give her a lot of slack. Harry, not so much. So, anyhow. so that's just a little, uh, little gossipy section in honor of Valentine's Day, which has come and gone. And uh, on that note, it's time for our, our uh, musical segment. Um, so let's uh, let's tune in and see what we're gonna be dealing with this time. So the song "Home with You" is one that I wrote in March of 2020. Uh, it was part of the COVID lockdown collection of tunes uh, that I wrote in like about one or two months. That was part of a, an album called uh, "Songs from the Apocalypse." And I uh, played the uh, uh, Shopping with the Apocalypse song, which was a dark look at all the hoarding going on with, in the stores. People hoarding toilet paper, water, food, medicine. Uh, not exactly uh, humankind's finest moment. Um, Home With You is actually a, a love song. I was sort of thinking about you know, sort of the tragedy of COVID. When everything locked down, people lost their businesses. Uh, kids were isolated. Um, obviously, people were getting sick and 
a lot of people die. So this song, I was looking at the uh, the issue of like new relationships. And I thought about, you know, what if you just started dating somebody? Or, you know, or you're just starting to get close. You, you know, two people liked each other, but they're told to stay inside and, and not go around people. Um, that uh, would be kind of crazy. And I'm thinking of the early stage relations and they're not ready to move in together. So I think couples that were at that point kind of did move in together, maybe a little earlier than they might have. But I'm just thinking about that very early stage and um, you know, what, uh, what that would have been like. So uh, that's, uh, that's what Home With You is about. It's a quarantini love song. Musically, I will note that I got the, the music from, I was playing around on the guitar and I had, was playing a Eric Clapton, that Eric Clapton Babyface song, um, Change the World, playing around with that. And I started trying to play the Paul McCartney Live and Let Die song. So musically, for those who have the ear, um, Home With You is sort of a cross between Live and Let Die and Change the World by Eric Clapton and then something else entirely. So uh, the, the influence is there. It's certainly not uh, plagiarized or anything mm. disgusting like that. Go out, love Never really knew how much I missed you Stuck at home, love Never really knew how cold the house was Without you And I never really realized What I missed till you were gone If I could reach you Then I'd leave my shelter If I could meet you again No fear in this world could keep me away Here with you I want to stay Wanna stay home with you, girl Spend all my days now Climbing on the wall Staring out the window Wonder if I'll see you at all And it never really struck me That I can't live without your love If I could hold you Then I'd leave my shelter This world could keep me away Here with you, I want to stay Want to stay home with you, girl
my shelter The ones above you Come back to me For the rest of my day Here with you I want to stay Wanna stay alone with you, girl climbing the walls, right? As the song referred to. But, you know, a lot of people, you would find things to do. A lot of people would do home projects and home improvement projects. And that leads us to the next segment, which is, I think, going to be our last installment of the DIY, Dumb, Idiotic, and Useless. Uh, so... Quick recap, last summer we closed down Caster's Pub for renovations, and one of the things we did was put a ceiling into the studio that's adjacent to the bar here. Um, and it was a struggle, and so I've kind of gone step by step for all you people into home improvement. So let's uh, take a look now at uh, the latest edition of DIY. So what is left? What remains, do you ask? Well, as you can see above me, there's a, a strip because that four by eight, I still need about a little less than a foot, about 10 inches, nine and three quarters to be precise. Uh, a strip of drywall going all the way there to the mid part right about there and then up above us here is a full eight foot strip also about uh, nine and a quarter inches but actually I calculated ten so that's what I'm doing and there's a reason for that because I screwed up this part of it and left too much of a gap in the above this so that when the drywall goes that little 10 inch slab of drywall goes in there there's still going to be a nice almost an inch of space there i'm going to have to putty it and everything else but what I can do is also make that strip a little wider because I can kind of slide it in more. Whereas down here, I made the adjustment and it's gonna connect pretty much right against <clears throat> this thing. Okay. <sighs> well, people, I now have a ceiling. Check it out. There's the one end. And then if we can go up here. Yes, 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 yes. All the way there. It's like a virtual tour, isn't it? All right, so that tripod is stuck. Fear not, I'll get you down. I'll walk you around here for now from this end. So. There's uh, one corner, the, the, the aforementioned uh, second hole for the light fixture, which isn't. <laughs> then you got all the way down there, all the way to the end. And then, you know, you've got, let's walk down this way. Now, yes, as you notice, there's still a strip underneath the beam, the notorious beam. Still needs to be enclosed. I'm gonna 
probably put that off for a while because uh, I'm tired of this shit. <laughs> so anyhow, there you have it. So a lot of, lot of uh, mistakes, imperfections, and whatnot. The walls were not perfectly even. There's no such thing, I guess. It's 20 years at least. So they're a little uh, wobbly. But uh, one thing we're gonna have to do is, and that is such a huge gap, that's like close to an inch there. Uh, may, probably too big to tape, so <laughs> I may try to shove a little bit of drywall in there, I don't know. Then it, it narrows as the wall, the vertical wall starts to protrude out. And that I think is probably a tape and, and the paste job. The, the first facing of the beam, of course, I cut too uh, short and there's a gap up there. That may be drywall or a lot of mud and tape. And then this, <laughs> right in the middle, I'm still at a loss. Uh, you know, I just, I don't know. That's almost an inch. That definitely the piece of drywall we'll put right across and screw it into those three plates there. But geez, you know, I don't, I don't know how I screwed that up. Uh, now the very first four by eight slab uh, really paid the price. There's a screw underneath there that I couldn't get out. I may have to cut a hole there. I don't know yet. I think there's a screw here too. Um, <laughs> that's bulging out. And the same with here. I believe those are screws that I have not located yet. It'd be nice if I could just get rid of the screws and then just tape over that instead of cutting a hole. <laughs> uh, back in the corner here, you see another gap. And that looks like, uh, again, a, that's a case of not the drywall, it's the case of the existing vertical walls being, well, it's like a Pink Floyd video, dude. So I'm gonna have to deal with that. And then same underneath there, you can see the insulation peeking up. Hello, insulation. Hey, hey, hey. Um, then as the wall moves out again, it kind of evens up. This thing, Broke that in uh, transport, that little corner. And corner, corners of drywall are treacherous. Really treacherous. So I got a lot of post-production work. Hey, it's the Fab Four back there. Um, but hey, and I ain't doing that for a while. I can't even promise how long it'll be before I do do that. I'm tired of shit. And I'm not done yet because the first thing I would do is this guy. And I'm worried about this because there's not much to hold on to after that experience. Now we're only talking about an eight, eight and a half inch uh, wide strip, but it's that long strip. I may have to cut it into four sections instead of two long sections. Um, but anyhow, uh, the, the good news is, thanks to giving drywall a chance, all we are saying, I was able to, to do it, you know? And the acoustics in here are great because there's nothing in here. And so I got to figure that out. I think that drum set needs to go. Uh, I think I... Uh, some of the other stuff needs to go too. But I really like the acoustics. Ladies and gentlemen, I am done. Yes, there is a lot left to be done. Painting is the final thing. But before painting, you have to prep that. With drywall, you've got to tape all the cracks and fix all the problems, and there's a ton of problems. But we do have a ceiling.
You get the whole thing. As you can see, I put that whole sucker in. That's it. Good show it here. Good show it. Well, let's see. We'll start in the corner. And there you see, this is the, the most recent thing I did. This was kind of a pain in the butt, but I'm so tired at this point. That, uh, there it is. The beam is now enclosed. There's a ceiling. Lots of work needs to be done yet. But yes, kids, put in a ceiling pretty much by himself. My young son did help me with the key stage and lifting up those big slabs. But basically I did this damn thing by myself and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So to my dad, wherever you are out there, touche. <sighs> well, all's well that ends well in the world of home improvement but yeah uh, it's just it's it's really not in my wheelhouse but i do try things every now and then before i sign off coming up in a couple weeks is one of my favorite holidays saint patrick's day next next go around we'll show some clips from last year's show which had a lot of uh cameos from my cousin over in ireland kevin oh say can you see Last year, I went to Savannah for the first time to uh, check out that celebration and took some video, and I, I, I want to share some of that with you. I can hardly wait to go back and look at that uh, video footage, because that was a, a fun time. Um, are you, there, there's some footage right now.